Adversity Advantage Podcast, where we will help you use obstacles, failures, and setbacks to give you that edge needed for success. I'll be interviewing people from all walks of life on how they overcame trials and turned them into triumphs. So please, sit back, relax, and get ready to be absolutely blown away by some of the wisdom and stories you're about to hear. What you eat drives hunger and cravings, depending on what it is. And most people eat stuff that makes them profoundly hungry when they're done eating. And one of the benefits of intermittent fasting or a longer fast is that, man, today was the hardest, crappiest intermittent fast of my life. I woke up starving. Like, hey, what'd you have for dinner? So you end up tuning your food so that when you eat, you are not hungry for at least four hours when you do eat. And when you don't eat, you're not very hungry for a while. But if you have this sudden crazy hunger after meal, like, okay, wonder what that was. And you start asking, I wonder what that was. And funny enough, that exact same time, you're going to be thinking angry thoughts about other people. Like, wait a minute. You mean I'm more pissed off at other people when I'm hungry because I ate something that wasn't compatible with my biology? And you start putting it all together and you realize that, Food is at the core and it's food and sleep and movement. You get those things mostly lined up and all of a sudden you can handle more in your life. I'm Doug Bopes, personal trainer, best-selling author and entrepreneur, and I'm on a mission to help others become the best version of themselves. So I'd like to welcome you to the Adversity Advantage podcast, where we will help you use obstacles, failures, and setbacks to give you that edge needed for success. I'll be interviewing people from all walks of life on how they overcame trials and turned them into triumphs. So please sit back, relax, and get ready to be absolutely blown away by some of the wisdom and stories you're about to hear. Welcome back to another episode of the Adversity Advantage. I'm your host, Doug Bobes, and today we are going to talk about fasting. When you hear the word fasting, what comes to mind? Is it things like, am I going to starve? Or maybe it's, is it good for my mental health? Or maybe you're saying something like, I can't go 20 hours without eating. What am I going to do? I thought I was supposed to eat five meals a day. I thought I was supposed to eat six meals a day. I thought I was supposed to eat first thing when I wake up. And I hear you. And I have thought all those very same things. And as somebody who has experimented with fasting through the years, I can tell you that those fears that I had originally were not true. And that when I fasted, I felt better physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And it's something that I do daily. I fast typically between 14 and 16 hours, sometimes 18 hours a day. And I feel great when I do it. I typically will eat my last meal around seven or eight o'clock at night. And then I won't eat again until about lunchtime after I work out. And many of you might be might be thinking these very same thoughts that I had before I started fasting, like, well, how do you do that on an empty stomach? Or um, were you going to pass out? Or did you get dizzy? And all these things that were the same very feelings that I had. And so my guest today is here to calm your fears on all things fasting and help explain how each and every one of you can fast in a way that suits your lifestyle and the amazing benefits that come along with it mentally spiritually, emotionally, and of course, physically. And his name is Dave Asprey. And Dave is the father of biohacking. He is the founder and chairman of Bulletproof. He is also a three-time New York Times bestselling science author. He is the host of the Webby award-winning podcast, Bulletproof Radio, and has been featured on the Today Show, CNN, the New York Times, Dr. Oz, and more. And his newest book, Fast This Way, delivers an absolute masterclass on fasting and will inspire you to give fasting a second chance or try it out for the first time. And today, Dave delivers an absolute breathtaking interview on all things fasting and how to get started. And he also shows you that fasting can not only help you improve your physical health, but your mental, emotional, and spiritual health too. And we also get into the biohacking and his definition of it how to fast from things like hate and negative thoughts, and of course, Dave's incredible backstory that got him started on this journey and so much more. So I cannot wait to share this incredible conversation with you. So let's get this thing going and welcome Dave Asprey to the Adversity Advantage podcast. Dave Asprey, welcome to the show, my friend. Hey, Doug, I'm happy to be on. 
Yeah, we were just chatting for a bit before, and I know we're going to get into in the depth about fasting and biohacking and immunity and things like that. But I think where I want to start is I want to paint a picture for the audience because I think a lot of times people wonder where people get their ideas from, whether they're talking about things like fasting or biohacking or health or whatever it is. And what I really love about you is it came from your own transformation. And we were talking before we recorded about 2008 how it was an important year for both of us as far as having a spiritual awakening, changing the way we took care of our bodies and our health. And I would love for you to kind of tell the story of who Dave Asprey was before entering that cave. What kind of thoughts was he having? How did you take care of your body? What was your self-esteem like? And then how that experience impacted how the message that you're sharing today? Well, I, I'd weighed up to 300 pounds in my early 20s. And I had a brief bout of fame because I was the first person to sell anything over the internet, what we would call e-commerce today. It was a caffeine t-shirt out of my dorm room said caffeine, my drug of choice. And all of a sudden I'm this kid and I've got a picture of myself in a double extra large t-shirt in Entrepreneur Magazine, fat face and pimply cheeks and all that. And it didn't make me happy. So then I get to Silicon Valley. I'm like, I'm going to help build the internet. I can see how big this is going to be someday. Like, it's incredible. I'm just, I've got this fire in me. And I make $6 million when I'm 26. I was a co-founder of a part of the company that held Google's first servers. We grew the company to be worth $36 billion uh, wow. on the NASDAQ. And I'm the youngest person and the only non-executive who can attend board meetings as long as I don't speak. <laughs> so I'm like, <laughs> like, you couldn't do better in your mid-20s. And I looked at a friend after I made $6 million, who'd also made a, way more money than either of us should have. And, and I said, I'll be happy when I make 10 million, which is the single biggest douchebag comment of many that I think I've ever made. And so I'm like, okay, fame didn't make me happy. Uh, money didn't make me happy, right? Uh, I'd been in a bad relationship for about five years. And when that ended, I'm just like, geez, like what is going on with me? Like, why I'm an engineer. I like to think I'm pretty smart. Why do I keep making decisions that are against my own interests? Like, like what is happening? And I had already tried everything to lose the weight. I had worked out an hour and a half a day, six days a week for 18 months straight on a low fat, low calorie diet. And I couldn't lose the weight. And I realized I'm going to have to hack this. I'd start hanging out with people three times my age who were reversing their age and learning their techniques to fix my own biology. And I was frustrated because I was running this, this nonprofit anti-aging group and we're four minutes from Google's headquarters and we had one guy from Google ever attend. Okay. And here it is. This is like the most precious knowledge. Do you want to live an extra 30 or 40 years? And no one would come. And the one guy from Google who came was my uncle. <laughs> it's like, God, I wasn't getting it. And back in 2008, I had done some personal development work. I had been to South America. I'd done ayahuasca. Before it was a, a thing, I went down there and they're like, Dave, you're white. This is for locals. You'll throw up. You won't like it. Why would you ever do that? Was basically what they said. And I said, no, really? So they rustled up a, a shaman and came in with his carved jaguar head and led a ceremony for me that was, that was impactful. But it, it was that and holotropic breathing and a lot of just like starting to pay attention to why do I do what I do? Like what parts of me are running things when I'm not paying attention? And good God, who wrote that code? Because it's bad code. <laughs> and you could call that trauma. So I, I realized that even though I was you know, married, I had a, a daughter who was about one in, in 2008. I still had like at my core, I was afraid of being hungry. Even though I'd lost the majority of the weight, I'd been told, look, if you don't eat six times a day, you're going to be in starvation mode. And worse than that, I was really working hard on not acting like a jerk. <laughs> so every time I would get hungry, I'd get hypoglybitchy and I'd yell at people. Right? And this is really common. So I was afraid of acting like a jerk because I was hungry and I was afraid of starving because I was hungry. And I also realized I was afraid of being alone. I'd rather be in a relationship with a crazy person than just be by myself. So I'm like, I got to deal with this. So maybe I'm a bit extreme, but I hired a shaman and said, hey, I want you to do a vision quest for me. So drop me off in a cave. I want no food and no people anywhere around. So I'm just gonna have to deal with this. And if I lose my marbles, at least no one's gonna see me lose my marbles, right? Pick me up in four days unless something eats me. And that was what I, I just, I felt the, the need to do it. And this isn't in the book actually, but right when I was at the, the shaman's house, I was about to leave. I, I got this, this phone call 
uh, from someone really close to me who was like, Dave, you have to come back. I, I, you can't go do this. And it wasn't even like their voice. It was just like their voice, but it, it almost looks like not them talking. I go, what, what do you, what do you mean? Like, well, if you go, there'll be consequences. And I'm like, if I don't go, there'll be consequences. And it was like the sense of frustration. And I was just like, I'm just, I got to do this. I, I felt like called to do it to, for lack of a better word. So I went out there. I'm like, I'm just going to face down all my fears. And it was a pretty amazing experience. So this is the first of my books. And I think this is number seven. It's the first one where I've ever done like real quality journalism storytelling. And I, I talk about, okay, here's what it was like to go do that. And then here's the science and here's how to do it. And the God's honest truth is that I could have, like, like the recipe to write a fasting book is really easy. Step one, don't eat for a while. Step two, mm -hmm. here's a bunch of references from PubMed that say it's good for you. And there's like several really good fasting books that share this information. In fact, in 2014, I published The Bulletproof Diet. That intermittent fasting is a major pillar of it, which was, I think, one of the very first big diet books that had intermittent fasting built in. So what could you put in a fasting book that's not there? It's the spiritual side of fasting. And it's the how do you fast when you have a life? Because most fasting is like, oh, you're going to fast for several days. You're just going to rest. And like, you're going to go be an, an Instagram influencer. And the reality is that most of us have a job. I, I'm actually, I have four companies right now, <laughs> aside from Bulletproof, where I have a good management team in place, right? So I'm working, right? I also have two kids. I have a wife. I have a community. I have a family. I have a personal development process. I don't really have time to feel like crap every morning. And when I was in Silicon Valley, there's no way I could have fasted until noon because I was fat. Because even when I wasn't that fat, I still didn't have the metabolic flexibility. So I would have acted like a jerk. I would have got fired and I would have like not shown up in my life. And it is possible to do intermittent fasting and to do fasting in a way that's compatible with having a life. And it's possible to say, I'm going to shift gears. I'm going to go into a spiritual fast. I'm going to go dig deep and find out what's going on in there. All of that's in this book, which is what's missing from the, just don't eat for a while, just tough it out. No, people don't want to tough it out because they're toughing out their life. <laughs> that was why I, I did this. And it was my experience in that cave and my experience of saying, how much of my time and energy do I have to give up to get well? And the reality is no one wants to give up anything to get well. In fact, no one even wants to be well. What... I don't want to give up anything. I don't want to kick ass. That's the reality that everyone has. But most of us are afraid to admit it because we somehow feel like that's cheating or that's wrong. No, that's the core driver of all human innovation is laziness. I don't want to spend all my time baking bread. Let's invent baking powder. Like every invention we ever have was to save time and energy. And I'll be damned if you cannot save time and energy by fasting. <laughs> and that's why it's a useful book. Yeah, 100%. And as somebody in your shoes that I'm sure gets asked a million times, like, what's the easiest biohack that's going to change my life? What's the one thing I can do? Biohack, biohack, biohack. I'm sure you'd be the first to say that the easiest hack, quote unquote, you can do is to work on yourself internally and do the work so that whatever biohacks or health things you try will be that much easier and they'll be that much more meaningful. And I think that in a world where fasting has become incredibly popular now, it's, it's all over the internet for, for various reasons, you've continued to be an innovator and at the forefront of all this stuff. And it's not like you're just jumping on a bandwagon. And I can attest to this because I've been reading about your work for years. I think years. I helped to build this bandwagon, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> I don't know. Is, do you think that's accurate? <laughs> I would say so, because there weren't a lot of people talking about it back when you first started. And you and I were talking before we were recording, and I started doing it probably eight years ago. And I remember when I first started doing it, I had trainer friends that were like, dude, you're crazy. That's not healthy. Like, <laughs> they hated me, man. <laughs> yeah. And, and at first, selfishly, I was doing it for the aesthetic reasons. I learned how it could boost your testosterone. I learned how you could just burn fat, just pure fat. Because everybody, that was like the biggest question is like, how can you just burn just fat without eating away at muscle? And intermittent fasting was like the only thing that was proven to do that. So that was what, selfishly, that was why I did it. But then I started learning and experiencing the cognitive benefits. I was less stressed. I was more focused. I wasn't thinking about my next meal or stressing out. I was like, I'll just eat when I eat. Cause as humans, like you said, you're always, we're taught to like focus on when our next meal is going to be, what's for dinner, what's for lunch, what's our snack going to be instead of eating when you're hungry or eating in a way that fits with your schedule not just following the standard American diet. Am I correct? Yep. It's exactly right. 
everything you just said there. It's one of the highest return on investment things you can do. Because let's see, what do you invest? You don't actually invest money in stuff. You invest energy and in stuff. Right. It's first energy, then time, then money. And if you're sitting there going, Dave, I'm making 20 bucks an hour, F you. Okay, guys, I welded truck frames and put auto parts in boxes for five years. Right. <laughs> so like, I, I get it. I will tell you, even then, at the end of a day, when it's 90 degrees in the warehouse, you've been breathing dust and you're covered in you know coil springs, it's still how much energy do you have left at the end of the day to do what you want to do, right? And if you have more energy, you can always make money or time. Mm. But if you don't have energy and you have time, you'll go to sleep. And if you don't have energy and you have money, you'll still go to sleep. So it's always about energy you invest. So you wake up in the morning, you either make breakfast, which make, just makes you want a muffin at 10, or you skip breakfast. Maybe you do the fasting hacks in the book, which really help people get going on intermittent fasting. And they help people who are intermittent fasting who are like, I probably shouldn't fast today, but if I do this, I can, right? So on a morning when you're not sharp, you can do this and still intermittent fast. And magically, you spent less money, you spent less time, and you got more energy. So it's like the highest return you could do because the investment was less than making breakfast. <laughs> that's, right. that's the lazy part that motivates all of us that we don't like to admit. But yes, I'm lazy. Well, and I think you touched on a really good point and that when we think about making any kind of sacrifice or transformation or doing anything hard, we think about everything we have to lose. Well, I can't eat this. I'm going to starve or... I can't go out with my friends or I'm going to lose this or that instead of like focusing on the positive, if you will, what you can actually gain from doing something challenging. Cause we know that when you do hard things over time, you build confidence in yourself because you've proven to yourself that you can do things you never thought you could do. And then you just keep getting better at it. Right. Like you talk yes. a lot in the book that it's not about going from not fasting to a two day fast. It's about maybe starting with just skipping breakfast or maybe just skipping a meal here and there and maybe trying a 12 hour fast and being like, okay, I can do this. Cool. Let's try 14, do this. Cool. 16. Then you look back and you're fasting for 16 to 18 hours consistently. And you're like, how did I do this? Well, it just started with me taking that first step of getting comfortable, being uncomfortable. And it just progressed from there. So what are some easy ways other than what I just outlined? I mean, I just was very general that someone could get started and say they've never fasted before, say it intimidates them. They're asking this, the same things are going through their mind. I'm going to starve. What am I going to do? I'm going to die. I'm going to pass out. How can somebody get started in a way that's going to be sustainable? In Fast This Way, I write about three fasting hacks. Mm -hmm. And there's a group of people saying, well, hacks are shortcuts and that's not fair. You just have to do the work. And first off, you know what a hair shirt is, Doug? I don't. So I heard, I heard you use the term on Tom's show. Yeah, on Tom's show. I, I want everyone to know about this because it highlights this human drive, especially in the U.S. that we have. I think it's Puritans helped to found the U.S. So it's that suffering has merit. Right. right? And truly, you suffer until you do something about it. But there's a mindset that says, well, if suffering has merit, I should cause more suffering intentionally. So these Catholic certain types of monks a long time ago would make shirts out of human hair that were super itchy and they would wear those after they'd like whip themselves and self-flagellate <laughs> so that they could suffer more because they were so bad. And the view most of us have of fasting, if you've never done it before, is like, why would I put on a hair shirt and go whip myself? This sounds like hell, yeah. right? It's the exact opposite of that. But the first time, if you're to say, I'm just not going to eat for 18 hours, you are probably going to say, I'm sitting in a meeting. All I can think about is muffins. And I have no idea what this guy's saying. And I'm going to turn off my video on Zoom because I'm just got to close my eyes. And like, like, or you'll just yell at somebody. Hypoglybitchy is a real term and it is exactly what I was. So none of that is going to happen if you use any of the three fasting hacks. And one of these has never been talked about in the world of fasting, but it needs to be. So one group says, well, mice only had water, so you could only have water during a fast. I'm like, well, mice don't have espresso machines. And if, if we have an endpoint in goal, which is metabolic flexibility, what are the things you do during a fast that don't ruin the beneficial effects of the fast, but make it easier so that you suffer less? In fact, you don't suffer at all. Mm -hmm. The first hack in fast this way is black coffee. And people are saying, well, wait, what? Well, it's not water for one thing. And why is it a hack? Well, it's because the amount of caffeine in two small cups of coffee will double ketone production. 
So your body will start making a few ketones after eight hours of sleep. You have a bit of an earlier dinner, which is almost almost qualifies as an extra fasting hack. You have dinner at five or six instead of seven or eight. Then you get an extra couple hours before you go to bed without eating. And then you can you basically can eat lunch earlier the next day. But you have that coffee. It doubles ketone production. What do ketones do? Ketones suppress the hunger hormone called ghrelin and they raise the satiety hormone called CCK. And you don't need a lot of ketones. You need much less than if you're in the keto diet or if you're taking keto salts or the other like gasoline flavored ester kind of things. You don't have to use hardcore ketone supplements. Just a cup of coffee can help. Caffeine also is a hunger suppressant. It also gives you more energy. So wait, you address energy and hunger with a cup of coffee at the beginning of your fast? Most of us have a cup of coffee anyway, but it doesn't work with fake sugars. You can put stevia or something, but none of the sucralose or NutraSweet or any of that. And you don't put any, any, anything at all in there. No protein and none of those artificial creamers and stuff like that. We're talking black coffee. The second fasting hack that's much stronger for hunger suppression and is tested, people lost a million plus pounds doing this, is Bulletproof Coffee. It is coffee with grass-fed butter. It doesn't have to be very much. In fact, we've learned some things about basic water chemistry since I first came out with Bulletproof Coffee. I funded research at the University of Washington that figured out putting a little bit of butter fat and suspending it and blending it in water changes the water so your body can more easily use that water to burn fat. So it saves your body a step. You, we oftentimes get cold when we fast. If you blend a t- even just like half a teaspoon or a teaspoon of butter, a nominal amount of fat into that, it will change the way your body can use the water. And when you add the C8 MCT, which the Bulletproof brand is Brain Octane, I'm the guy who made MCT famous, and you do that, you blend it up, and the MCT is an exogenous, which means outside the body, source of ketones. And that is such a powerful fasting hack and it's it's been tested out for 10 years and it turns your brain on as it would feel and as i write in the book after two days of eating nothing maybe two and a half days you get this wave of ketones and all of a sudden you don't care about food and you have tons of energy you can do that the first time you skip breakfast if you use bulletproof coffee and people say well you had calories it's not fasting bs (laughs) fasting means your insulin didn't go up and it means that you're liver didn't have to turn on protein digesting enzymes. When you do bulletproof coffee, you still have this burning up of dead and old cells and old protein in the body called autophagy. So like, wait, you can do that. So there's two fasting acts. One is black coffee, one is bulletproof coffee, kind of in order of operations. And the third one that's missing from the world of fasting until now is prebiotic fiber. Prebiotic fiber cannot be digested by your body. It can only be eaten by good bacteria in the gut. And it is known to extend human lifespan. Most people don't get enough soluble fiber. I'm not talking metamucil or sawdust. This is stuff that dissolves almost instantly and it dissolves into water or into the, into coffee. It doesn't have much of a flavor at all. So you can put 20 grams, which is about the amount you want every day or more, and you can have it during a fast. And your gut bacteria will eat it and turn it into short chain fatty acids that are ketogenic. So All of a sudden you put that in, which is a massive hunger suppressant. And you're like, wait a minute, I didn't get the constipation that comes from keto. I fed my good gut bacteria. I didn't eat any protein or any carbs. So I didn't turn off the benefits of autophagy during fasting. And here's the thing. The average person, 15% of the thoughts every day in their brain are about what's for my next meal. When you do what I just talked about, especially if you do all three of those, you have Bulletproof Coffee, you add the, the prebiotic fiber. The Bulletproof brand is called Interfuel, but you can get it. I tell you all the ingredients. You can get whatever you want if you want to do something different. Just be careful that it's got the right stuff in there. You don't want like extra roughage fiber. And what happens is someone sets the plate of bagels or donuts or muffins or something in front of you at that mid-morning snack that most people who don't know how to have breakfast will want. And instead of going... I'm a good person. I'm going to exercise willpower. I'm not going to eat this. You just look at it and go, I'm so full. I don't want it. And you're still fasting. Like that's why this is such an amazing thing. And that's why I wanted to write this book because you can feel that way the first day you try intermittent fasting. It's that big of a deal. And there's so much power in doing something you never thought you could do. Cause there's a lot of people I'm sure that are in that seat looking at those donuts and those bagels that have eaten them time and time again. And when they 
this time say, no way, I'm good. I'm going to wait and eat a healthy lunch or I'm going to wait and eat later in the afternoon. They're like, wow, I can't believe that two weeks ago, I was so concerned about what I was going to say to my friends when they offered me a donut or my coworkers and I got through it. And that's going to bleed out into other areas of their life too. It's going to help them do harder things professionally, personally, spiritually, because your body doesn't exactly know what type of adversity. It just knows that you're getting through adversity in hard times. And it's now re rewiring your brain to say, oh, you had a challenge. You got through it. You moved on to the next thing. Let's do it again. And the coffee thing works. And we were talking about my experience in jail before we recorded. And my cellmate, whenever I was hungry, he'd have me drink a cup of black coffee because of the exactly what you just said. Gives me, it gave me energy to work out, the, the appetite suppressant, and it helped me get through the day. And I, this all works. And I was telling you before the show, like I've been experimenting with this stuff for quite a while. And I've said this before, and I'll say it again. What I really respect about you is that you're not just a, a zealot just talking about fasting because it's popular. You're talking about these things because it's helped not only yourself, but tons of people that you've worked with throughout the last, I mean, decade or so. And I have a lot of respect for that. And the one Thanks, of the things Doug. that, yeah, the, well, one of the things that I, I also like in the books, I was like, all right, well, what's this book going to be about? Is it going to tell me I have to fast and I have to eat these certain foods or, or nothing? Is that you have this flexible approach in there? And it's about sustainability and longevity. And it's not just about doing a 24 hour a day fast every single day. It's like, here, be flexible. Try a 24 hour a day fast when you work up to it. Do a day intermittent fasting, have breakfast, have pancakes if you want with your family one day. Like the point is just, it's a journey. And you'll probably learn that if you don't fast and if you eat like crap in the morning, you'll realize like, I don't want to feel like that again. So maybe you'll, it'll motivate you to get back on whatever plan you were doing, but one of the things I want to dive a little bit deeper into is the mental health benefits of fasting. Oh man, it's a big deal. Yeah, because right now, I mean, it's no secret. There's a lot of people struggling with their mental health. Pre-pandemic, during the pandemic, as we go throughout the rest of this year, people are struggling. And what are some simple ways that that fasting can really help somebody who's really stressed out right now? They're anxious. They're fearful. They're not sleeping well. Like, what are some mental health benefits oh. of fasting? The first things is you get 15% of the thoughts in your head back. Right. Okay. <laughs> and that's huge. To do any kind of personal development work, it takes more energy than to just lay on the couch or just do what you do today. So many people fall for this trap of saying, well, I'm not eating well. Maybe having a glass or two of wine or alcohol at night to, to chill out. So my sleep isn't good. I'm not really taking care of myself, but I'm going to go start a you know, personal development process. I'm going to go try and work on myself. And then they really struggle. And they're struggling because they aren't making enough electricity in their cells to actually power self-improvement. If you want to improve your biology, you have to have enough energy to run your body and break down cells and build healthy new cells. And if you're running at like 40% of your possible energy production, you don't know that. You just feel like yourself, but you don't have the extra willpower and willpower is biology. If your cells are just awesome at making energy and you give them all the energy they need, you're like, okay, I'm going to push through and I'm going to hit a new level and I'm going to actually unpack why I'm anxious, like what's really going on in there. But the systems that are making you anxious, they don't want you to know what's going on in there. What's going on is fascinating. This is also a major part of the book. This is the first book where I've really written about this to this level is as I was writing my big science book on energy production and the brain, uh, which was Headstrong. And that was a book that made the monthly science bestseller list with like the secret life of trees and sapiens and homo deuce. And as an author, that just a huge honor to ever make that list because I, I wasn't expecting to. <laughs> and when that came out, I, I just like sat down and was kind of stunned like, oh my God, like this is just amazing. And after just the thousands of hours of thinking it takes to create a book like that, I was like, wait a minute, there are rules that guide all life that explain everything in the human condition, including all the weird anxiety and stress and things like that. Here's what all life forms do. And here's why we do it. Okay. We have a quadrillion ancient bacteria inside our cells. They're monitoring the environment and they're making decisions on a microsecond by microsecond basis. How many hormones do you get? What proteins do you get? How much energy do you get? 
right? So they're trying to decide without the benefit of you or your brain or you knowing, oh, don't worry, lunch is coming. They're just like throughout all of history, all life forms have died of starvation. So they run this algorithm and trees do it. A cactus will do it. A skunk will do it. It doesn't matter. Humans do it. Step one, 10 times more energy than everything else. It's fear. It's run away from, kill, or hide from scary things. And it doesn't matter if they're actually deadly. They're just scary, right? And unfortunately, fear doesn't get run through your conscious brain. Fear gets run through your unconscious nervous system that keeps a deer alive, that keeps a piece of cheese alive. Like it is environmental sensing way before you get to see anything. And so that I think can a lot of people right energy. now with everything going on are subconsciously more fearful. They don't even know it just based oh, yeah. on what's going on. I, I think if you'd be weird, I mean, it would be weird to not think that, right? I mean, <laughs> and well, the, the thing about fear is you don't think about fear. Mm. Fear is rarely because you thought of something, although you can you know, think yourself into a fearful situation. It's mostly, it's a feeling that happens without a good reason. It just happens. And most of the reasons we're afraid of things, most of the reasons that you were an addict and most of the reasons that you made your bad decisions and I made my bad decisions, I've made tons of them, is that, that fear word and we'll do anything to get out of a fearful situation, even if getting out of the fearful situation involves opiates, even if getting out of the fearful situation involves running away from something that you needed to face, even if it involves hiding. And fear is a major reason that we all do things that we're ashamed of. But when we're done and we, we're not in a, in a 10x energy fearful state, the next thing is food. Right, and food is there because every every species has starved to death over time. So there is an operating system running in your body right now that says eat everything because you might not have a meal tomorrow. You have a meal tomorrow, but it doesn't know. So it gives you the feeling that if you don't eat this piece of pizza right now, you're going to die, right? And it feels like you're going to die, but you're not. And the reality is that you can go two or three months without food before you die. <laughs> now, it feels like if you go 24 hours without food, you're going to die, but the feeling is a lie and it's a lie to keep your meat alive if you're not in there. And the struggle of personal development, the struggle for anxiety is who's in charge? Is it you or is it the automated systems keeping your meat alive in a world where you can't think? And the third F word is the F word you think it is because it's what all species have to do to reproduce. And that gets about three times more energy than it really needs because we are wired to know that if we're not getting some on a regular basis, the species might die. So we have an innate desire to do it. And if we actually have love in our life, including sex, then we are more relaxed. We're happy. Our oxytocin levels go up. And if you don't do that, you feel like you're going to die. Like something looming is bad and you've got to do it. And those three F words that all steal your energy are in the way of the fourth F word, which is the magic one that all life also does. It's friend. And that's when you build community. And if you're a bacteria, you get together, you make yogurt or kombucha or beer. Right? And if you're a forest, you make a forest. And if you're a deer, you make a herd. And if you're a human, you make a community and a tribe and you specialize. And we are wired in our cells to support other people. So how does, what does that have to do with fasting? Well, with fasting, you're dealing with the second biggest F word that sucks your energy. And most of us have food tied to survival, even though it doesn't need to be, right? So now we're afraid. So you're hungry, you feel hunger, which means I'm going to die if I don't eat. And you feel fear because it's got the I'm going to die part of it. So now it takes 10 times more energy because that's fear and five times more energy because that's food. And what's left at the end of the day, not much. And when we decide we're going to look at the real meaning of fasting, Fasting means to go without. You can fast from drugs. You can fast from alcohol. You can fast from junk food. You can fast from the news. You can fast from air. It's called breath work. And when you do it, your cells get stronger. You can fast from heat for brief periods of time. It's called a cold shower. And all of these training the body to feel safe by going without makes you more powerful in your cells, in your nerves, in your brain, in your heart, in your body, in your spirit. And it's that inner voice that says, you will die if that is lying. It's true. You will probably die if a tiger jumps on you. Don't worry. You'll always have reflexes for the tiger. But my path has been, well, let's pick the lowest hanging, easiest fruit. Turning off hunger, 15% more thoughts, tons more energy, fixing your metabolism. Now I can go tackle fear. And I tackled my fear in that cave. And I've tackled my fear with neurofeedback and holotropic breathing and ayahuasca and all kinds of personal development practices. But I could do that. In fact, I have proof that this works 
Because when people are doing my neurofeedback program called 40 Years of Zen, this is a five-day intense personal development brain upgrade with computers showing you when you're acting out of fear so you can't cheat. And well, people can do two and a half times more deep personal work every day if I give them brain octane oil and bulletproof coffee, right? You hit the wall and everyone's hit the wall if they've ever trained or just done something like, I have no more thoughts left in me. I can't make another decision. I can't lift another weight. I am drained. Well, if it takes twice as long to get drained because your metabolism works, you can tackle anxiety and fear. And that's what we're dealing with is the feeling is real. The feeling is based on a reality that's not real. And then it's an argument inside of you. Who's in charge, right? And all of those fears, they come from traumas. They come from things that we believe that are not actually true. And I think there's a lot of people right now that feel they have no control. They feel uncertain. They're filled with fear and they don't know what step to take. And they're shackled. There's people that don't want to leave their house because of the virus. And then they're right in feeling that way if that's the way they feel. And just like there's the people who are right to feel insecure because they don't know where their next paycheck's going to come from things being shut down. I mean, that's all very real. But I think the problem is there's a lot of things that haven't been talked about in the mainstream media on things you can do to control your mental health, the things you can do to improve your immune system, things you can do to boost the way you feel and improve the way you act on a day-to-day basis. And I heard you recently talk about strengthening your inner mask, right? (laughs) Really putting that on. And I'm serious in a way that's like, there's a lot of people that they feel shackled right now because they don't feel they're in control of anything. They're scared, they're uncertain. And I think when people feel they have some sense of control, they gain this thing called empowerment. And when they feel empowered, they become more optimistic because they feel that there's some sense of meaning in whatever they're doing on a day-to-day basis and they're getting to that next level. So what are some quote unquote hacks that people, small hacks, that small wins, I'm not talking about not everybody has to do the stem cells or get coffee enemas and that sort of thing, but what are some things that, because I think when people think of biohacking, that's like the first thing that goes to their, their mind is like, okay, I don't want to get a coffee enema. I don't want to get stem cell or whatever. Oh, wait, I've never been a proponent of coffee enemas. Well, know, if you're going to do it, just cool your coffee off first. That's my only <laughs> piece of it. <laughs> well, well, I think when people hear the word biohacking, they, they might get confused at what it means. And to me, well, I, I feel me, just, go ahead. Let me share the definition. So it, it's a new word in the English language in 2018. And, and my name's actually in the dictionary, which is cool. And the definition that I wrote, which isn't the exact one that they used, but the one when I started the movement, it was the art and science of changing the environment around you and inside of you so that you have full control of your own biology. Mm. Now, the reality is that we do not have control. We don't have control of whether a comet hits the planet. We don't have control over whether some elected douchebag does something or another. By the way, I could give a, a shit about what party they're in. Right. I just don't care. Right, like, right. If you ran for politics, you're probably not a good person. <laughs> so there's my uh, party support for you. But, and by the way, there are some people who have good intent to go into government. Unfortunately, you'll still fail at doing good work there. That's just kind of how government algorithms work. You know, step one, stay in power. Step two, who cares? <laughs> So you don't have control over that, but what you do have control over is a spiritual state. And there's actually a pyramid or a a stack of these three states that we work on. And the first one we work on is empathy. Okay. Can I feel someone else's pain? Okay. That's a good skill to be able to have. Our mirror neurons do that and all this. The second thing though is compassion. All right. So now I, I could feel their pain because I could feel empathy towards someone and a higher level operating is, okay, I have a desire for them to not be in pain. And I'm actually feeling something different than just empathy. Empathy is relatively low level, but the state that we're all looking for is the highest one called equanimity. And what mm-hmm. equanimity is, is I can feel empathy when I want to, but I don't have to. I can feel compassion for someone. I can see that they're suffering. I can see that they're suffering for whatever their reasons are, right? But I'm okay, right? And equanimity is the idea that I'm okay no matter what's happening around me. Like your happiness, your inner state is yours and you do have control over that. It just doesn't feel like you do because you have a system in your body that's trying to make sure your meat's alive and it keeps getting in your way. And you can train that system the way you train a dog right? And it will behave itself. And when you do that, you get stronger and stronger. So equanimity is what we're seeking. And biohacking comes from, okay, change the environment around you. The easiest thing to change is your food because it controls so much of what you do. 
your exercise, your breathing, your light, right? No coffee enemas required, no stem cells required. Mm -hmm. But I write about those things, or actually not enemas, but I write about those things because if you want to change your biology, you want to have full control. I'm looking at, you know, what are the billionaires doing to live an exceptionally long time? And if we can figure that out, and in fact, I do as much of that stuff as I can so I can write about it, that's just like cell phones. They used to be $25 a minute and 50 grand to buy one. And now they're a dollar a month in Africa. So what's available now is that, that we can just barely see will become widespread over the next 20 years. So you are going to be able to control your biology more than you can. But right now, what, how do you eat? How do you breathe? How do you sleep? If you handle those things right, and how do you move? Yeah. You do that stuff, that's biohacking. And the idea that it's a hack is maybe you're going to do it in the easiest way where you put the least amount of energy in and get the most amount of energy back. Whereas before, the entire history of exercise, pick up rocks or run away from tigers. That's it, right? Everything, whether you're pumping iron or whatever, it's those things. Maybe we can do that in a better way so you get more muscle and less time. Let's do that. Maybe you can put something on your plate that makes your abs look the way you want or makes your brain work the way you want. Or maybe you put nothing on your plate because it works better. I just want to know what works best so I can spend more time doing what I care about and less time trying to manage myself. But I also recognize we're all going to die. Why? Because the universe will collapse in on itself at some point. I know we're all going to die. And I don't know if I'll be around at that point. Probably not. But regardless, I'll take every step I can to feel and be the person that I want to be. And that, I think, is, is the kind of control to focus on. So I don't have control over whether someone says, oh, let's destroy the middle class and shut down all small businesses while allowing the large ones to stay open. No one's going to be able to control whether the Washington Post is writing alarmist articles that directly enrich the world's richest man by creating extra fear. Yeah, that's happening. You don't have control over the algorithms on social media. And some people fall into this conspiracy trap I'm going to believe this. Like, honestly, you probably don't know what's real and what's not real. I don't. Right. But I do know what I can do to have that state of equanimity, knowing that there are douchebags doing douchebag things out there all the time. There always have been. Sometimes there's more, sometimes there's, there's less. But how do I show up as the person I want to be today, right now? And how do I feel a sense of calm, even in a storm? And if I'm in the situation, which I have been in, which is I don't have enough money to make rent, I don't know. I have exactly enough money to eat leftover pizza or rice for the rest of this week until my next paycheck comes. I've been there, right? And what, what you end up with is, okay, what do I have control over now? What you have control over is your state. And if you allow circumstances to dictate your state, it doesn't work. And funny enough, fasting is one of the easiest things you can do to give yourself more control over your state and to show your automated systems that you're in charge, they will chill out. And when they chill out, you got more power, you got more control, you got more peace. That's why I wanted to write this book. That's amazing for so many reasons. And I had David Sinclair on and he talked about like, like hacking your biology by changing your lifestyle and how you treat your body on a daily basis in your health and how it can actually reverse the aging process and, and everything else. And the other thing I think you touched on that's incredibly important is focusing on what we can control. And a lot of times in life, I think we're, we want to get this certain result, we, and the, but the things we do on a daily basis are polar opposite of that. So for people that are in an incredible amount of fear right now and pain and uncertainty, scrolling on the internet and going down rap, whatever rabbit hole it is. I don't care if it's the conspiracy theory one. I don't care if it's just watching mainstream media, arguing with people on social media is going to raise your stress levels. You're going to be more anxious, more depressed, and it's going to get you the polar opposite in what you're looking to do. And I invite people to take that advice of simply just controlling the controllables. What can you control? You can control your nutrition you can control your sleep, control how much water you drink, if you're going to eat processed foods or not, who you're going to spend time with, exercise and go on and on and on, you have control over those things. And I think in a world where we spend 97% of the time focusing on the problem and 3% on the solution when really we should flip that, like think about if you just took the 97% of the time that we're focusing on the problem, put that towards the things you can control and the solution, how much better off you would be several months from now. And I think one of the things you touched on in the book with regards to fasting, and I could be butchering this a little bit, so correct me if I'm wrong, 
is you prove to yourself that your thoughts aren't real. Like I think you make the analogy that when you're fasting, one of the first thoughts you get when you're first doing it is I'm going to die. I'm going to starve. And you realize that's not true. Yeah. So it gives you confidence in knowing that all your thoughts aren't true. Your emotions aren't reality. Their emotions are there, but not everything is, is real in the context of the logistics of the world. So I want to piggyback on the fasting a little bit for the mental health and some of the other things you mentioned in the book that could really work wonders is the, the dopamine detox, the fasting from social media. And the one yeah. that I thought was really interesting you shared was the fasting from negative thoughts, which yeah. I think in a way, the way you put it, it was enlightening because we all have negative thoughts. I mean, we're human beings. We're going to get negative thoughts every single day and we're, we're wired to do so in many ways. How did doing those two things have such a profound impact on yourself personally? And uh, what advice can you give to the audience if that's something they want to endeavor themselves? When you read Fast This Way, it, it starts out with kind of the biology and the personal development. And it ends up in, look, spiritual fasts are real. And how do you go deep on that? And I'm going to invite people, if, if you decide to read the book, send me a receipt on fastthisway.com. And I'm teaching the book. I'm leading people through two weeks of, of me actually using it as a textbook. And every day, giving a lecture, there's going to be two or three live Q&As. And it's starting at the end of, at the end of January. So I'm, I'm doing this to lead people who've never fasted or people who are experienced fasters through the different hacks and just why and how it all works. But we're ending it with a fast of either one or two days that's a spiritual fast with breath work and the personal development side of this. But fasting from hate is the hardest thing to do. And I actually recommend starting with a four-hour fast. So all right, for the next four hours, I am not going to think negative thoughts about other people or other things. It's exceptionally difficult to do when you first start trying it. I have the benefit of 40 years of Zen training. I spent four months with electrodes on my head. And I have a little process in my brain now that runs and it monitors my thoughts. And anytime I'm thinking negative stuff about other people, you're thinking hateful thoughts. I'm like, all right, there's my automated defense systems doing that. That I still can recognize, okay, that person is acting out of integrity. They're working against my interests. I'm going to stop them. But you can stop someone doing bad stuff without hating them. And one of my favorite stories comes out of Japan and it's an old, uh, probably a fable, but there's a, a samurai and his, I guess his master is killed by another samurai. So he says, all right, I'm going to avenge the death. And he goes throughout Japan and he kills everyone uh, in the other samurai's camp. And he's chasing him across Japan and he finally captures the other samurai and they're in battle and he's about to strike the final blow. And the bad guy samurai spits in the good guy's face. And the good guy stops and he puts his sword away and walks away. And, and, and the bad time was like, why, why didn't you kill me? And he goes, oh, well, you spit in my face and it made me mad. And I didn't want to kill you in anger. I just wanted to kill you because it was the right thing to do. So I'm going to kill you later when I'm calm. <laughs> so it's kind of dark, but it's that can you take right action without thinking bad thoughts about other people? Can you acknowledge that someone did something that was out of integrity, something that was negative for the world, bad for the planet? But can you do it without hating them? Because hate costs you a lot and it doesn't do anything to the other person. And so the idea is how do you be a pillar of goodness and to do the right thing without being motivated by anger and hate, but being motivated by doing the right thing. And that's hard. And starting out with a four hour fast and just noticing during that fast, how many times do you go, God damn it. Oh, mm -hmm. shoot. I just thought a hateful thought towards the can of whatever that wouldn't open or towards whatever happened. And you get to the point where like you can get pulled over for speeding in a way that was totally safe. And that was actually the right thing to do because it got you there faster and you didn't put anyone at risk. And you can just be super pissed at the cop and the legal system, or you can just be like, okay, I'm going to pay my driving tax right now. Right. And knowing, yeah, I, that was inconvenient because I needed that money for something else, except you didn't actually need the money for something else. You wanted it for something else and, and you'll still be okay. Right. And it might be inconvenient, but you'll still be okay. And now the transaction goes from surprisingly, the cop is less likely to write you a big ticket because you're not acting like an asshole. Right. But this is what fasting from hate does because you realize, oh, I can do everything I want to do without having to be pissed off all the time. And when you do that, what happens? Anxiety drops dramatically. And one of the easiest times to exercise that muscle is if you're doing a longer fast and maybe you didn't do the hacks. You're like, man, I'm feeling really hungry right now. 
look what my brain does without my permission when I'm hungry. Hmm, maybe I can train it to do better. And this creates such a powerful sense of peace that the cool thing is it rubs off on other people. So you walk in and you're in that state, they snap out of their anger and pissed off states and they're nicer to you anyway, which lowers the amount of stress in your life anyway. So it creates this spiral where, wow, I really like the world I'm in now. And it's because you're at the center of the world you're in. We're all at the center of our own world, at least from our perspective. It, yet we're still part of something bigger. And it's fascinating, but four hours, don't think about thought. And if you break that fast by thinking about thought, it's not a failure, it's awesome because it shows you what your brain's doing when you're not looking. So you can look more. You're right. Cause in order to get where you're going, you got to first determine where you're at and it starts with self-awareness and that just that one simple mindset hack you just shared, I think was worth anyone listening to this entire episode about changing your perspective when something bad happens, because in reality, no matter what, we're going to have bad things happen to us for the rest of our lives. It's just the way it is. And I think so many people go down this rabbit hole of sabotage after one small bad thing happens, you use that example of getting pulled over, you take the, the flip side approach and say that really pisses somebody off and they're like, screw this, screw that. They're stressed out about where the money's going to come from or they're stressed out about being late to dinner. And they're, I mean, I can go on and on about like what's going through somebody's mind in a, in a negative connotation. And then you get home, you end up having two glasses of wine, two bourbons. Maybe you get into a fight with your spouse because now you're under the influence. You're already, it's amplifying yeah. your emotions and then you're in a three-day fight with him or her, and then you go on and on. And like a week later, you're depressed, you're miserable, you're drinking every day, and you're like, how the hell did I get here? It all yeah. started with that one situation in which you could have handled it differently by your perspective and like leaning into it, making like, you know what? Like, I'm kind of glad that happened. It taught me that I need to do a better job of not speeding. I learned a lesson, or, or maybe drive or maybe just uh yeah. Maybe you need to keep speeding, but do a better job of looking for speed traps. Exactly. <laughs> that's yeah, that's totally what I'm like, how can I, how can I do that better? Right. So I want to kind of close, close our conversation. Cause it's been, there's been so many meaningful tips, hacks, takeaways, just from your own experience on fasting, health, things you can control to limit fear and stress and everything. And, but I want to remind people who are listening to this to get Dave's book because in the book, he goes into so much depth about different fasting protocols. He talks about one thing that I think should have been talked about a long time ago in the sense that there's, there's different ways to fast for men and women. Like if you're a whole chapter on that, right? Yeah. yeah. Different. Uh, he talks about fasting for fitness, for your mental health, your emotional health, for your gut health he goes on and on about each one of those subjects. So I encourage people if they want, more info or more detail to, to buy the book. And then if you enjoy the book and you want to take Dave's course to please do that. So as I said at the beginning, you're always on the forefront. You're kind of like the Gary V of biohacking. You know, Gary V is always like the guy calling things like Facebook's going to be huge. Get on Instagram, get on this and that. And I'm like, dang, he was right. Yeah. He's, and he's I, a great guy. He's, right. he's been on my show. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But yeah, he, he sees the future and, yeah. and I'm and the same way, man. Yeah. I, all of my books have stuff in them that says this has to be true and it works. And then a study comes out several years later, like I knew brain octane, C8 MC, it worked better than coconut oil, better than MCT oil. And five years after I, I put it out there, finally a study comes out that shows, oh, four times more ketones than the cheapest MCT that's on the market. I'm like, there, I felt it. I knew it, like everything lined up. So there's a, it, it's okay to give yourself permission to say, you know what, I'm doing something that works and I don't know why, but I felt and I measured that it worked. So I'm going to continue doing that. And so I'm, I'm fortunate to I don't have the right radar and be the right kind of guinea pig for that. And something else, Doug, that I think your listeners would benefit from that we haven't touched on is that what you eat drives hunger and cravings, depending on what it is. And most people eat stuff that makes them profoundly hungry when they're done eating. And one of the benefits of intermittent fasting or a longer fast is that, man, today was the hardest, crappiest intermittent fast of my life. I woke up starving. I'm like, hey what'd you have for dinner? So you end up tuning your food so that when you eat, you are not hungry for at least four hours when you do eat. And when you don't eat, you're not very hungry for a while. But if you have this sudden crazy hunger after meal, like, okay, 
wonder what that was. And you start asking, I wonder what that was. And funny enough, that exact same time, you're going to be thinking angry thoughts about other people. Like, wait a minute. You mean I'm more pissed off at other people when I'm hungry because I ate something that wasn't compatible with my biology? And you start putting it all together and you realize that food is at the core and it's food and sleep and movement. You get those things mostly lined up and all of a sudden you can handle more in your life. And right now, resilience is the name of the game, whether it's your immune system, your inner mask, whether it's resilience for you know dealing with whatever's in the news today or whatever's happening in your financial life. It's all about, do I have what it takes to handle what life brings my way? And that's the original meaning behind the state of being bulletproof. It's like, I've got enough to handle what life brings me. Fasting is a part of it. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up about the food because I think it addresses that, in order to get where you want to go in life and in order to heal or get better or do anything challenging, or you have to figure out like what's at the root of all that, whether it's purpose, whether it's your why. And the example you just shared, if you're waking up hungry after your fast, instead of like looking at the problem in the here and now being like, I'm hungry. Well, why? Like, why, what did I eat last night? And then addressing the root cause. So that way you can get better the next time. I mean, I, I used to experience this. I mean, I, I did it. I never really followed a, a standard protocol or did anything. I just kind of just took, picked my window, ate whole foods, protein, healthy fat, complex carbs for me, which they worked for me. But, and, but I could remember when I first started, when I would get hungry in the morning, it would be because I didn't eat enough food. Maybe I had clients too late and I just didn't mm-hmm. eat that last meal or I didn't get enough healthy fats or something that would keep me satiated throughout that next morning into lunch. So is there anything like that you're seeing right now or working on that, I mean, is going to be something big in the next few years, like getting back to you being the, the innovator? Well, I've, when I created the universe of biohacking, I, I put everything in that first infographic that, that helped to start the movement. And some of it was a little bit out there, especially 10 years ago. If you'd have talked about light therapy, I'd already used lasers and high intensity LEDs to fix my brain. But if I said that stuff, people would just be like, oh my God, this guy's telling me light's going to do something. But now we know light does something. So circadian biology is a big deal. My company, True Dark, that makes sleep glasses, they're not just blue blockers. Blue blockers are about a 1990s tech and too much during the day, not enough at night. But the idea that we can radically change how our cells work by choosing the right light bulbs and wearing the right color glasses in the evening or during the day, it's a really big deal. And it's finally reaching the mainstream. And you'll see people on camera like, oh, it's nighttime. I'm going to wear these glasses and I'm doing it because I want to sleep tonight. Right. And they're willing to do it for the first time ever. So this is becoming a normal thing where people think, yeah, yeah. I eat the right foods, but I also sleep well. And in order to do that, I have to control my light. So I think we're going to see a world over the next 10 years where people are actually having systems that dim their lights at night, which is only sane. There, you're going to see a lot more houses that have red colored lighting like mine does. People think I must be a vampire. But <laughs> whatever the deal is, all makes your lightings that way. It doesn't disturb the three species of owls and all the, the animals on my farm. It doesn't draw bugs to my house. And I walk outside and I can see the stars because I changed my lighting and I can still see. Stuff like that, we're finally realizing that it matters. So light's a nutrient, air is a nutrient, and food is a nutrient. And we're starting to really realize we can modify all three of those relatively easily and that the return on investment for doing that is so big. Whereas if you went back 10 years or 20 years, those are, that was crazy pants. Like even an air filter 20 years ago, I was like, oh, what are you, some kind of weird hippie? And now people are like, oh, gee, maybe there's stuff in the air I don't want to breathe. And maybe it's not really coronavirus, but it's air pollution, right? It's toxic mold. So I just feel like we're all waking up to the fact that, wow, there's all these variables that affect me. What are the variables that matter most? Let me just knock those off. And I feel so good all the time. And because I feel good, I've had lots of people, Dave, I, I went bulletproof. I lost 30 pounds but I had so much energy that I got a $40,000 raise. Like, is that normal? I'm like, yeah. Or, <laughs> oh, uh, we couldn't get pregnant. All of a sudden, Dave, I'm blaming you. because <laughs> We just got pregnant because we started taking glutathione and we, we ate more saturated fat and like really big stuff that changes your life from small changes. You just have to know what small changes. And I'm pissed that when I was young and I was fat, that I did what they said. They said, oh, a calorie is a calorie. All you have to do is exercise more than your calories. And I beat myself up. I caused thyroid issues. I did stuff that was not good for me. And I did it for a long time because I believed it would work. And the modern equivalent of that is kale or a plant-based diet. 
Well, Sorry, yeah. kale is bad for you. It causes cravings. It's bad for you on multiple levels. And a plant-based diet ruins your cell membranes. And so, look, you can yell that something you want to be true. You can just pound your fists and turn red in the face and say that something is real. That's not real, but the data doesn't lie. And we can gather data now. So that's, those are the big changes. That's incredible. And I think you did a really good job in the book. I mean, I think most people know what to eat. I would make the argument that people despite what they might admit, inside know that they should probably not eat processed foods. They should stay away from sugary food and soda, alcohol, and all that stuff to be healthy. I would say most people probably know that. I would say most people probably know the reasons why. But I would argue that most people might not know how to eat or when to eat, which I think you did a really profound job of describing in your book and how to do it in a way that's flexible and it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. And I also believe that sleep optimization and doing things to uh, manage our focus is the thing, right? With things like whoop, the aura ring, chili sleep, we go on and on with these different things that are, that are popping up now that people are drawn to because they're like, okay, I've gotten certain hacks to track my fitness, my steps, how many calories I'm burning, track what I'm eating on a daily basis. But how can I really track things like my sleep? What can I do to make sure that I'm addressing the foundation of what of our health, and that is how we sleep. One question I know I'm going to get asked that I wanted to ask really quick before we close is morning routine is big now, and people are getting up at 5, 6 a.m., and they're going and working out first thing. How can people incorporate fasting when they're following some sense of morning routine where they're doing a, a rigorous workout at 5, 6 a.m., and they might not eat until like noon according to their fasting schedule? The very best time to work out is at the end of a fast. Mm. You want to get the maximum benefits from it. If you, just because of the circumstances of your life, yeah. you the only time you have to work out is first thing in the morning. It's really not an ideal time biologically. Right. It creates extra stress on the body. But hey, it's better to work out than not work out. You don't need to work out every morning. You need to move 20 minutes, going for a walk and getting some natural light in your eyes uh, without glasses or anything. Uh, and just going for a walk for 20 minutes is going to be better for you. Right. <laughs> and do your heavy workout only two times a week in the morning, maybe three times a week if you need to, if you're looking to, to get extra gains. But you don't want to do more than that because then you'll be overtrained. You won't recover. So, and by the way, you may disagree with me that there are people who are like, go hard every day. I did it for 18 months and I still weighed 300 pounds. I had, I could max out all the machines, but I still weighed 300 pounds. So I was overtrained. My cortisol was too high. Well, I think so, that as I've gotten older, I've, I've realized less is more. Like I don't need to yeah. work out for two hours, six days a week to, to see results. Less is more. Yeah. Like, yeah more. It, it's like, yeah. if fasting is good for you, you'll just never eat again and then you'll starve to death. And if exercise is good, it doesn't mean more exercise is better. It means <laughs> everything has a Goldilocks area. And our job is to tell the body, okay, this is your average. And every now and then you're going to be way up here. And every now and then you're going to be way down here. So you better be ready all the time. But if it's always way up here, always way down here, it just grinds you down. And this is why never exercising is crappy and exercising, lifting heavy till failure every single day. It, it tells the body basically like there must be a war on or something because like this isn't normal. So from that perspective, on the mornings when you're going to do a heavy workout, have breakfast, have a ton of protein and some fat after your workout, right? And then don't have dinner. It's that straightforward. In fact, there's a whole chapter on combining light and food timing to become a morning person or to become more of a night person. If you're, there are people who suffer, I got to go to bed at eight o'clock. I'm so tired. I wake up at three every morning and I hate my life. Well, what if you woke up at six every morning? Can you shift? It takes about two weeks using the protocols in the book. Anyone can become the circadian rhythm they want. And it's a combination of food and light. You can't do it with just food. You can't do it with just light. And I actually, for my entire life, since I was about 10, my bedtime has been 2 a.m. I write my books late at night. I love the quiet at night. I'm genetically wired to be the night guard. And I was surprised reading that in your book. You were like, I, I, it's, it's X AM and I'm writing right now. And I'm like, really? I was, but no, I, after you explained it, I realized that that's just what works for you. It is what works for me, but I have kids. I dropped my son off this morning and he, he had to be at the bus stop by 720 or something. And it's not compatible to stay up till 2 AM and do that. So I go to bed at 1030 every night now, naturally without having to force myself because I used exactly what's in the book. Say, all right, I'm going to do that. And when I was writing the book, I changed my lighting and I literally stayed up till four in the morning. I go into this weird altered flow state and I just crank the words out. And, and it's, it's a really like a special time for me. 
But what I did though, to return to circadian rhythm is I controlled my food intake and my light. And literally within one day of finishing that two week period of staying up really late on my final edits, I was back to my normal thing. It's really liberating to have control of when you're awake and when you're tired and you can do it. You just can't do it with only food. You can't do it with only light. It's gotta be both. And that's a good way to end it. And I think for those listening, hopefully this has inspired you that you actually can get started in, in this fasting journey. And it doesn't have to be black and white. It's flexible into what works for you. I'm really glad that, that Dave brought up that point of on the days you're going to do heavy training and you're not used to fasting for long periods of time, like have breakfast, like eat a solid meal and that's okay. And the next day, if you want to fast for longer and not exercise, and that's okay too. And what you'll realize in the book is there's an approach that I think can work for anyone, whether you're a male, whether you're a female, and it really outlines um, in detail how to do each approach as well as the meaning behind each one. And what I was enlightened to see is the spiritual, mental, and emotional aspect that occurs with fasting too, because let's face it, if we're constantly focused on what we can gain externally, we'll fail internally. Whereas mm -hmm. I believe if we're putting the focus on what we can gain internally, our external world will be a byproduct of how we feel inside. So if you can really master that, the external things that you're looking to get will come anyway. And yeah. yeah. And so if you're listening to this for multiple times, I've said this buy Dave's book, take his course. If you really want to get started fasting and not and sure. And it's free, by the way, it's a gift. I just, I want people to know this because you become a better person. Everyone around you yeah. is better. So no, I don't want money from you. Buy the book, which goes wherever you buy books. And just sign up for the course. Let me teach it like we're talking now. Uh, just fastthisway.com. Put your receipt there. And I'm recording a ton of brand new content for this. This is a full-on course like I would teach at college. Cool. Well, and if they want to find you, you're at Dave Asprey on Instagram or Dave.Asprey on Instagram? I think it's Dave.Asprey, yeah. Okay. And then all your books are available where books are sold, Amazon, uh, Barnes & Noble, that sort of thing. And... And for those listening, all I ask outside of if this conversation inspired you and you want to learn more about fasting and get Dave's book is to screenshot this episode, share it with the audience with one of your biggest takeaways. Maybe it was something Dave said about his journey that hit home with you. Maybe it was something he said about biohacking. Maybe it was something he said about you know fasting or any of the other tidbits he shared on health and let us know what you think. We always are looking for feedback. And once again, thank you, you all for your support. And thank you once again for listening to this episode of The Adversity Advantage. I'm your host, Doug Bopes. We'll see you next time.